Welcome to US Tiji 360. I'm Ginger Chang. Happy New Year, everyone. Our feature story today is about Paul Sanguesa's remarkable journey of moving on from his past and abusing alcohol and drugs. We have a special guest with us today. This is Peter Lin, a psychologist. So Peter, according to the National Institute on Drugs, addiction is a chronic brain disease. How does it affect brain function? That's a very good question. Thank you for asking. I think it's very important for people to understand that um, psychological disorder, one of the common ones, is actually drug addiction or alcohol abuse. <laughs> and, there, and the definition of addiction is really dependence, even either psychological or physical dependence. And when people depend on something, they develop tolerance mm -hmm. and they also have withdrawal symptoms. And statistics show that about 15% of our population can actually develop alcohol abuse oh. and about 6% of drug abuse. Wow. So this is a very common problem that we're oh. facing today. Wow, okay. Thank you. So having said this, let's go take a look at Paul's story. I'm looking at it differently now. You know, before it was like I felt like she abandoned me. The truth is, is I made wrong choices. I surrounded myself with bad people. And, uh, you know, it was, um, I'm sure it was very painful for her to admit that to anybody else. You know, I'm trying to look at it how a mom would, you know, that's like if you were a mother and someone asked you how your child was and he was locked up. I mean, how would you feel about yourself? So, you know, I look at that and, you know, I pray all the time that, you know, someday she'll truly, genuinely forgive me and so I could hug her and cry, you know, because I miss my mom, you know, she doesn't know how much, you know, but it's, um, it's something that I know um, God will in his time, even if it's the last day, I know she will forgive me. I have faith. About 12, 13 years old, I got into alcohol. And, uh, you know, alcohol and drugs became a way of life. And uh, I quit school after I enrolled in the seventh grade. And I got involved with uh, hanging out with people that didn't go to school. All they would do is party. I mean, it was like acceptable in the environment I grew up in. And it became a way of life. And then um, around 17, I got a job. And uh, I realized that you can make money working. I didn't know that because I had never went to school. I was always out stealing and lying and cheating. And, um, you know, it became a way of life. Drinking was part of my life, you know, from a young age. And so I got into a lot of legal problems. You know, drunk in public, drunk driving. I started going to jail, and um, the judge used to sentence me to, you know, juvenile hall, then the county jail, and as I got older, the sentences got stronger, so I ended up in prison. And uh, throughout that whole time, you know, my kids, what I realized today is my kids were watching these events as they were growing up. Beginning in 2006, Tiji Medical Foundation started a series of medical caring projects for the homeless. It was through these projects that Paul began to build good ties with Tiji. After evaluating his situation, we decided to make dentures for him. During the treatment, which was about two years, we interacted. It was one of the smoother cases. From a recipient of our project, now he is a giver and he has returned to his old routine. He found his family and pledged to make up for the lost familial relationships in the past 30, 40 years. This has really touched us. The years of alcohol and drugs took a toll on my teeth. She listened. It's like when I talked to her, it was like I knew her for a long time. She just had this peace in common. 
Like she was really concerned, like genuine concern. You know, gratitude, I didn't really understand what gratitude meant until that happened. Now I really understand because I experienced it. It's like, wow, it's like, man, whatever I can do to help, to help pay and show you that I appreciate it, that I'm grateful, I will do. This lady did something for me that, you know, no one has done. And it just touched my heart. It's like, I can't even describe what I went, the feelings that happened. We hope that the help that we are offering are treating the key problem. So we would rather spend more time make more interactions with the patient to understand their needs. We hope one more drug or alcohol addict will recover in society. It's not about giving you dentures so you can find a job. If the bad habits are not improved upon, these items that you give are useless. If we maintain a good interaction, we have more opportunities in the future. And we want to achieve a win-win situation on top of fulfilling this need for dental service. 50-year-old Paul Sanguesa finally found his confidence after getting his dentures. Paul not only opened up his mind, made amends with his dark past, but he also used his positive attitude and found a suitable job in a short period of time. The owner of the building here uh, needed a handyman for my for me, for me to, uh, so I could uh, explain things to the handyman to do. And uh, so he came over and, and finished up an apartment that we had to get ready for the people to move in, clean the windows and, and do some touch up painting and, and little things, fix a faucet. Um, and that's how I met him. That's when he started to work here. And that was about a year, two years ago, a little over two years ago and we've kept him on ever since because he's available to, to do whatever we has to be done here on call. You know, he, he, sometimes he comes over right away, other times maybe a day uh, because he's busy some, something else, doing something else. So, uh, but he usually comes over and takes care of the problem, you know. You know, I think he's, he's a pretty good guy, you know, down underneath. He, he, he's willing to help, you know, no matter what the situation is. Outside of work, Paul acts as a life consultant. He helps friends who are trying to quit alcohol or drugs by sharing his personal experience and tirelessly offers his help. Hey, are you the one that was looking for a sober living? Is that what is that you? That might be the last call before they die. Drugs, I mean, all it takes is one shot or one drink to drunk drive and you never know. I know what makes me do the things that I do is that void in my heart. You know, I, my whole life I drank, so when I quit drinking, I didn't know what I was doing. Now I'm learning how to talk to people, you know. I get to do this, I get to, you know, I just do whatever I have to do. Paul also manages transitional living housing for the people who need a place to stay after they're released from jail. Because you don't kick a man when he's down by drinking. You know, so when people have guests, you're allowed to have guests, let's say your family. Let's say you have some legal problems and your pr probation officer has to come. They can see that you have a living room, you know, you got a TV. Here you have a computer, you have a fax machine. There's a lot of people would look for jobs online now. Or if you want to go on Craigslist or, you know, whatever it is you want to do. I let them have access to the computer and the telephone. So they have a house phone, if they don't have a cell phone, they have a house number that the people can call. Here's Daniel, and then this one was the guy that left, but he's coming back, that's gonna be Alex. Some people, you know, we don't, you know, sometimes they only stay for two weeks, sometimes they stay for a month. How long it ever it takes for them to get back on their feet? We encourage people to just, you know, stay here for as little time as you can, so it has other people. We had these people here. I had six people. You got three guys in this room. Obviously, they didn't clean the room when they left. If someone gets thrown on the street, they can just sleep for, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna find a place. I can't just leave people on the streets, my problem. But I have a walk-in closet. Everyone gets their little space. This guy has this drawer. This guy has this drawer. And this guy has some drawers in here. He, this guy's the one that just came back, so I told him put the stuff on the bed. 
he, uh, he had to go back to the hospital because he kept drinking. I said, you can't be here. If you drink, you can't be here. The hardest part is the first two or three months when you leave rehabilitation. You know, because you're looking for a job, you don't have nowhere to go, you don't have money for rent. Because if you go rent something, you need first and last. You don't need that here. You don't need a credit report. You know, we know where you came from. I heard this story as well. Like, uh, you know, other people have mentioned it. And it was, it was inspiring to me as well. Um, you know, coming from a similar background, not as, as, as uh, severe. <clears throat> but uh, it's like, uh, how can I mention this? It's like when you're an addict, you understand another addict. You know, you kind of understand what they're going through and, and, what, and their needs and wants and, and their difficulties. Whatever helps them out. Plus it helps me out, you know. It, it, keeps me, uh, it keeps me involved with the new people. So I don't go backwards. I just keep going forward, you know. A lot of prayers. The National Drug Survey shows that some children are already abusing drugs by the age of 12 or 13. It seems like adolescent is a critical time for prevention. Is this true? Yes, it's very true. If we look at the statistics, we can see that uh, common addictions such as marijuana use, mm -hmm. cigarette and alcohol, those three, the common onset for those three addictions are actually adolescents. So this is something very important to know. So why is it some people are more prone to becoming addicted to drugs while others are not? Very good question, and I think it's important to know that there's no one cause mm -hmm. for addiction of any kind. And there are many different kinds of addiction, but in the, from a psychological point of view, addiction in general serves as a defense or a way of dealing with negative feelings that we have. So when we have negative emotions or feelings that we do not want to feel, mm -hmm. addictions are ways that we use to cover up the negative feelings. Uh, works for the short run, that's why people use it, but do not work for the long run. So it's very important to learn other ways of coping with our negative emotions. Mm, I see. Okay. Well, fortunately, Paul has found solace in giving back, and one of them is volunteering in Siji. She was talking to someone that I had known. And uh, so I said, hey, who's that? And you know, I found out a little bit. And then one day I said, hey, well, you want to go have coffee? And we talked. And then, you know, we started dating. I, I never knew how to date. So she, she said she didn't know how to date either. So I said, well, we can learn together. And we started going to uh, other events. And we did a lot of talking. We started to get to know each other. You know, and, and we've learned a lot from each other. And we have... Uh, we both have the desire to do the same path, you know? And that's why uh, we both together did the sports arena thing, because the desires of our heart are similar. And, uh, you know, that's hard to find. You know, it's like um, in Suchi, you see the husband-wife teams. And, you know, she's not my wife, but, you know, just say like she's my partner. And it's like, you know, she's a good person. I'm learning to look at the quality, the good qualities in people. Because it's easy to point out the bad, you know, because it's obvious. But you know what? A good quality, if you keep looking for the good, you'll find it. Everyone has good in them. You just have to pull it out, like Shirley sure did for me. I didn't know I had good. But you know, at the more I talk, it's like, well, I'm not that bad. And so now I just try to do good. Patient, we will yeah. be here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're doing like this. Number one, you're doing like an S. Right, okay. Yeah, you got it? Yeah, so okay. number one to the filling, same thing. Like yes. She's number one. Yes. You know, when you see those people, it's like, wow, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. I could have been that person. Uh, four years ago, I was that person, you know, waiting for dental work. And so, you know, it, it, it helps me. Uh, it helped me talk to the people, talking about the good things. I said, no, 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 these people will do whatever they can, you know, and then they have a follow-up. I just do the best I can. I've been through a couple of volunteer situations that to me, they, they weren't genuine. There was behind the scenes, it's like, you know, they're not about, it's about 
the organization, it's not about the people. Sioux Chi is about the people, not the organization. They represent their organization, but you know what? They have, uh, what I've experienced is their motives are genuine. They're sincere, they're honest, and they care for the people. Thank you. Oh, you feel good? Yeah, okay. That's a joy that, you know, no money can buy. And you know, when you do things from your heart, there's a value that money can't buy. Hello. Hello. She's the dentist. She's does the best work in the world. Yeah. So do you win? No. Thank you. Will you? I'm not that strong yet. From a life dependent on alcohol and drugs for more than a decade, Paul has shown his utter determination to transform himself. In a Thanksgiving dinner gathering sign language performance, he told everyone that change starts with yourself. With persistence, determination, and courage, you can do anything. Out there, you know, with the with the whole group singing and doing the sign language, it's like, wow, you know, life is awesome. We have an awesome God that gave him the chance to to just start his life all over again, you know, and uh, and that's that that shows that we really do have our God. It was something that I had never experienced, you know. Uh, it was, um, you know, learning the sign language. Am I going to do it right? I mean, and it's just a fear of failure, you know, because, you know, the way I was brought up was this, is if I wasn't good at something, I wouldn't do it. You know, I had to be the best or else I wouldn't do it because I don't want to show that I can't do it that well. And so when I was practicing the songs and I was trying to remember the words and the timing, you know, and it was like I wanted to impress, I wanted to be good and be like everybody else. But you know what is, um, the people, that, that the dentists and the doctors that were with me, it's like, wow, man, they treated me like I was equal. And man, that feeling was great. Even if I, didn't, if I wasn't perfect, you know, it was like no one was perfect. But you know what, it's like, they, they just looked at the good. It was just the effort of doing the event. And, you know, I was nervous because I don't like being in the spotlight and, you know, what if I'm doing it this way and they're doing it that way? You know, all that stuff goes through my head. But, you know, it's that's why uh, renewing of the mind, you know, it's, it's not about being perfect. It's just about doing the best you can for the right reason. And the right reason was for the fundraising. So even if I wasn't good, you know, the objective was to participate in raising funds to help people that were in situations like I am. It's something that I know um, God will, in his time, even if it's the last day, I know she will forgive me. I have faith. Pa's only wish right now is to reconcile with his mother and have her forgiveness. His story is an inspiration for those who are still struggling to overcome addiction. 
Peter, do you have any tips for our viewers? I think uh, Paul's story is very inspiring and can be a very good example for all of us. Uh, but in general, I think if you're an addict, you're probably the last person to know that you have this problem. So learning to face your problem is probably the one most important thing for anyone who has addiction. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, uh, there are several things that one can do when they have addiction. One is self-help, such as join the self-help group, uh, AA, Alcohol Anonymous, mm -hmm. or Tsuji. Tsuji is a great place for self-help. And also, learning to seek professional help, such as psychologists, psychiatrists, and also detox centers. Those are all important things that one can do to help their own addiction. Great. Peter, thank you, and it yes. was a pleasure having you. Thank you. In our next segment for Prince, we meet Ai Chu Mi, who was at one time a heavy drinker, smoker, and gambler before she became a Tsuji volunteer. Miss Mi had felt emptiness in her heart when she lost her parents at a young age. However, when she met Master Zheng Yan, the void in her heart went away because Miss Mi felt that she had finally found the long lost mother she had lost. My work life and personal life was very different in the past. During the day in my office, I was a great worker. However, my coworkers didn't know that when I was away from the office, I smoked, drank, and gambled a lot. When I was young, I loved playing ball. After every game, we would all go out to eat at a restaurant. The guys that I played ball with loved to drink, so I did too. I even won a drinking competition with another one of the players. As a young lady, that was my past. I had a good time, but when I would go home, I would feel empty inside since I was always alone at home. In 1996, Sister Lu En mailed me a Christmas package. Inside, there was a pamphlet about Ziji. After having been a single lady for such a long time, I was really touched to receive a wonderful card in such cold, harsh weather. Sometime after that, I traveled to Hualien, the spiritual home of Ziji. My own birth mother had already passed away, but when I first met Master Zheng Yan, I immediately felt that she was just like my mother. Master Zheng Yan became the mother that guided me on my path to spiritual wisdom. Since that time, I traveled back to Hualien once each year, just like a child visiting her mother. Master has helped me to transform myself. Since joining Ziji, I never smoke or drink because I made a pledge to keep myself pure. Ai Chi Mi is very proud that she has been sober and a vegetarian for over 15 years. Miss Mi says her solution to keeping to her vow has been using the Master's teachings as guidance and inspiration. I'm Ginger Chang, thank you and I'll see you next week.